Maybe it took you an hour just to get there. But now you're able to do it. So what was the difference? It was the drive inside yourself that led you to that. Okay? And sometimes we need encouragement. And so encouraging each other to do a positive or good thing, okay? I might not get any value out of that, but you did. And that in itself is a happiness that I'm getting. So charity is one of the qualities of a leader. Right? A good leader isn't just looking, oh yeah, I want to be the president, I want to have all this money and fame and so on and so forth, but what is the leader doing for the community, for the society, for the family, for myself, for my own life? Am I improving myself? That's one of the qualities, right? So charity, dan. So if we look at the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about that. Okay. Uh, one of the virtues, so I'll just reference uh, the chapter I'm talking about and in reference to what we're talking about here. And it's actually chapter 16. It's uh, the first three verses and it talks about virtues, right? And I'm not going to go into all the virtues, but I want to kind of get the concept out to say, so what about anger? Okay. We get angry sometimes. And it could be a couple of different reasons. Any reason why would you get angry? Because go ahead. Hate. Yeah. Things won't go your way. You get upset about it. Okay, very good point. So that's one thing, okay? So things don't go your way. So if it's not going your way, you're going to get angry, okay? Because why? You feel out of control, right? So a lack of control. And a leader, you want to be in control, right? What else? What? I was going to say the same thing. Oh, same thing. Anything else? The same. The same. That means, we're going to be angry, right? So we're going to be angry, right? We're going to be angry, right? We're going to be angry. So that's Exactly. So what she's saying is, if, if um, you know, something didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen, so again, similar to what you said, that um, I'm losing control of what's happening, right? So let's think about that. Do you have control over anybody? Okay. Anybody have pets? Cat, dog? Okay. Do you have control over them? No. Okay. Do you have control over the person next to you? No. So that means our whole life we should be angry all the time. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. So we just said we get angry when things don't go our way. Well, guess what? There's a million of us, more than a million, around the world. And we live with each other. We have our own kids. Do our kids always do the way we want things? No. Do you do things the way you always want? No. So does that mean our whole life we should be angry all the time? Okay, so there's a disconnect, right? What is it? Okay, so these are things that, yes, great. The Gita says that. How much did we understand out of that? Okay, so my goal is not let's run through all the chapters, let's read all the Gita chapters, oh yes, great, we, we finished the Gita in this many months or whatever, but it could be one word. Let's understand it. Because even if one thing out of this It could change your life. Any other comments? What do you think? Same thing. Same thing. You know, like same thing. I use just let's say today's example. I I always try wanted to come here in time, mm -hmm. but it's not in my control because I have to bring my daughter-in-law, my grandkids. Okay, do I? <laughs> Though I should be here, okay, I always come, but I couldn't, I came today right. five minutes after ten. Yes. Five minutes after ten. But, uh, you know, I, I know that before six months I used to get angry and all that, okay. My, my, my uh, mind gets so much upset, but today I was so calm and quiet. I said, see, you know, I don't want to be nothing. I just get quiet. Mind change. Mind change. Okay. Okay. So, uh, that, but so what you just said, what changed? 
You I changed. have to change my son. You changed? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the well, world didn't change. Yeah, world didn't change. Yeah. Your, your grandkids but still you have to get to school. class, yeah. right? You still yeah. want to get here. Yeah. But your feeling, your emotion yeah. changed because you changed the way you thought. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So that's the other point. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. Thinking, right? We think all the time. Yeah. If I tell you stop thinking, you're going to have a million thoughts of how to stop thinking. Okay? So even thinking, can you stop thinking? We talk about focus, we talk about meditation, concentration, right? We talk, I, I always point to the red bow or there or the tree or anything, right? Pick one item in this room and stay focused on it for one minute. Don't move your eyes, just focus on that. You want to have thoughts about that item? No problem, but nothing else. Okay, try when you go home. How long can you do that? She mentioned she's able to do it for 10 minutes or more. So, what's, what is that? If I say, can you ride a bike? Did you first know how to ride a bike when you first got on? No. But, do you know how to ride it now? Okay, so what happened? Between you didn't know, to the point you knew. You made an attempt. And you didn't stop. Okay, you had support, but you had to do it yourself. You had to make the attempt and continue to practice it until you get better. And, and now, you enjoy riding the bike. Before, you had so much struggle and stress and tension and you fell down and you hurt yourself. It's a lot of pain, but out of that struggle, you, you improved. Okay, you got to a new level of happiness that you didn't have before. You began to experience something that you never could have experienced before of riding a bike. Imagine going downhill on a gradual slope. You don't have to pedal, you just sit on and you just enjoy the breeze. Okay? Is that's a joy that you can't get just walking down the same street. And you can't explain that joy to someone that never rode a bike before. We have all these Sadhgurus, Mahatmas, and they talk about these things. We can't relate because we aren't there yet. And so they're trying to bring us to that level. It's like, you know, a mother holding a child's finger and saying, here, let me carry you over to that place. Okay? We can put, I can put my door on my shoulder and say, look up there. I want to do that. The gurus and mahatmas want to do that. God wants that. Doesn't matter. Do I want that? Okay? If I don't expose you to a something, and I tell you, think about this, and you've never heard it before, you don't know what to think. You never experienced it. And so part of being able to uplift ourselves is to be open. To be open to experiences you've never had before. To come out of our comfort zone. Once you're in a comfort zone, you have a rhythm down, you have a routine down, and it's working for you, or you think it's working for you. You're not 100% happy, but it gets me by. And I continue the routine every day. Why? Because I know the routine. I know at this time I gotta be here, at this time I gotta drop, pick up my daughter, this time I got grandkids, I gotta drop them here, come here, do this, do that. Those things I know. And all of those things are what? External. Things outside of myself I have to do for somebody else. Well, what happened to me? What happened to my own goals, my own desires, my own motivations? We forget. And so how do we recoup? You know, so we talk about doing some kind of prayers. So part of prayer is not to please somebody else. It's not to please Bhagavan to say, God, you know, help me with this and I'll do this. God has nothing needed. Okay? If God is God, think about it. If God is God, does God need anything from you? No. Who's in need? We are. So I'm the one that's in need. And so when I'm asking and saying, oh yeah, I'm doing this because it looks good, because other people say I'm, I'm great, or God will be happy if I do these things. Okay? God has no care about that. I'm not saying I know God so personally that you know, He told me that, but just think about it in a practical sense. If God is so perfect and all-knowing and, all, and God is everywhere and, and everything, Okay? All the descriptions we can give God is still not enough. So it's not God who needs anything. It's us that need something. And so if it's us that need something, so then what do we need to do? So that prayer is an exercise for myself, not anybody else. Okay? If one prayer doesn't work for you, do another one. Okay? No, I don't want to give Ram's name, I want to do Krishna's name. Okay. No, I want to pray to Jesus. Fine. No, I want to pray to that ball over there. Okay. Does it really matter? The, the point is, you know, you want to sharpen a pencil, you take a blunt pencil, 
take a sharpener, and you start doing the work. And that work is what we don't like doing sometimes, because I don't see the value in it. I don't have time to sit for five minutes, so I can't meditate, right? Well, I don't have time for this, I gotta do a million other things. But so, we, if we recoup ourselves, we can say, you know what? And even uh, people that take courses in terms of time management and things like that, these concepts come out. Because, all right, out of a billion things, what's your priority? Ten. Out of those ten, what's your real priority? What do you really need to get done today and you can't do anything else? Maybe four or five things. So those billion things turn into four or five things. Right? So if those four or five things are the most key things, oh, that's easy to focus on. I can get that done. All right. I get that done in the first hour in the morning. And then maybe I have something to do in the evening. Right now I have the whole day. I don't have to worry about a billion things. I need to refocus, prioritize things. And now I know, okay, out of these things, this is what I need to get done. Now I have some free time, okay? And we talked earlier, oh, we wake up in the morning, we brush our teeth, we go to work, you know, we take a bath, we have breakfast time and all these things. But when it comes down to our personal life, we tend to forget a lot of things in terms of how do I uplift my own nature, my own feelings, my own emotions, my relations with my own family, right? With my kids or with friends and family. So um, I would like to focus on things that are in the Gita, but make it practical. So we talked about anger. We lose control, right? So lack of control leads us to feeling angry. So what happens in our body when we get angry? What do you think? The emotional change and the physical change. Okay, there's a connection between emotion and physical, right? So if I get angry, then what happens to the body? What kind of physical change? Well, you get into like kind of violent action, Okay, so your actions, okay, so there's another thing, your actions are changed. Okay, so the, the emotion led to a physical change and then also an action that's very different than I would have done otherwise, okay? So a few things we're bringing out, so let's focus on the physical. What changes happen in the body when you get angry? Your health. Your health gets affected, okay, so uh, let's focus on that. What about health, what gets affected? Okay. All right. Heart attack, stress, right? So we watch a lot of movies, and you know you're in a lot of stress, and someone gets really angry, and you see an old old grandma get really angry at something, can't control what's going on, and all of a sudden she's got a heart attack, and you get into that, right? And so it leads to stress, tension. So those are what stress, tension are parts of the mind. Nothing to do with the body, but it affects the body, right? So the heart rate starts to beat faster. Blood pressure, right? That's what I hear you saying. Blood pressure starts rising, all right? Your face turns red. So blood starts gushing into certain areas of your body, all right? What else? What else could happen? Anything, body, mind, whatever, whatever comes to mind. Loss of discrimination. Okay, very good point. Loss of discrimination. You no longer can discriminate good, bad, evil, whatever. There's no nothing. You're angry, you're out of, you feel you're out of control, or somebody else is out of control, and you get so angry, you just do an action without being able to discriminate. Is this action going to be a good action or a bad action? You just do it. Then the thinking comes after, right, when you calm down. Bad judgment, right? You're not able to judge. Okay, so uh, an example I like to give, and I don't know if, if anybody's heard it, but it's something I wrote, that, you know, um, we wear glasses, we wear sunglasses, right? So we wear sunglasses, and um, maybe they're dark black sunglasses. When you look through them, how do you see everything? Dark, right? What if the sunglasses were yellow? There's a yellow tint to everything you're looking at, right? Or if they're red or green, same. So what you see is going to be through the vision of what you put in front of you. So when you have anger as the glasses, how are you going to see the world? The same way, through the, through the vision of anger. Things are going to look very different. It's the same world, remove those glasses, the world looks different, okay? And for a moment, you might have to squint your eye because it's so bright, it's so much light and energy that you can't take it all in, you gotta readjust your eyes. So let's make that practical. Anger, 
lust, greed. These are all spectacles of different colors, right? So we're wearing all of them at the same, all at the same time. And we switch them based on who we're with. You might be angry at somebody. Your friend comes by, oh, hi, how are you? I just, you know, we haven't met for so long. Suddenly the anger is gone because anger is for, towards somebody else. Okay? And at that moment you were so angry. Or what can happen? You're so angry, so angry, and your kids come to you, and you get angry at them, and you let them for no reason. And your kids can't understand, and so they cry or they get upset. Right? Why? So we pour our anger out to anybody and everyone because loss of judgment. Right? We're not able to discriminate one versus the other. And so anger leads us to do things that we normally would not want to do or hope we don't do. Right? So one emotion leads us to so many things. It has a physical reaction that can be tested. Right? When you're angry, go to a doctor. Your pressure is high. Your heart rate is pumping. Okay? You don't need to go to a doctor, you can see it. What if somebody walks in the room, like you know, someone did, and um, they're really sad, upset, they don't say anything, they just walk in. Okay. Are you going to feel that? You're going to notice that. You're going to notice that, right? So there's a level of energy that's within us. And if someone, like if Michael Jackson walked in here, Okay? And there's a story about him that people say he would walk into a room and all of a sudden everybody feels that energy. He didn't say a word yet. Nobody might have even seen him. But the moment he walks into a room, you see him or not, you feel this energy, this drive. So what is that? We are a ball of energy. Okay? What guides that energy? Our thoughts. Well, what guides our thoughts? I see you thinking, what, what's in your mind? <laughs> your intellect. Okay, so there's something to that. Your soul, okay. So now we're getting into the question of, well, okay, so who am I, right? And it's a very famous common question everybody asks. But I'm kind of driving you to that point in a logical stepwise process where it kind of makes sense, right? So who am I is a big question. Well, I don't know, and so many people say soul and this and that. But if you come down to it, all right, so I have billions of thoughts all day long, all right? Well, what's guiding those thoughts? And you said soul, you said intellect, okay? Any, anybody else? And there's no right and wrong. This is all a learning experience together. So your feelings. your feelings, okay? So your feelings can guide your thoughts. Your intellect can guide your thoughts. Your spirituality can guide your thoughts, right? So if you boil it down even further to say, what's the underlying principles that are guiding my thoughts? Let's use an example, okay? You're thinking of, I want to go to the gym, okay? What led you to that thought? What was your guiding principle to say, I should go to the gym? Let me go today. Desire to be fit. Desire to be fit, okay? So desire is the root cause of thoughts. So there's desire. Okay, so desire is one thing, and that's one aspect to look at it, to say desire is the root cause of thoughts. Okay, let's think about that, all right? What leads you to desire? Anything. I desire to be fit. I desire to love someone. I desire, I'm hungry, I, I desire pizza today. Where is the desire coming from? Desire is coming from the notion of happiness, that by doing okay. this, I, it'll lead me to happiness. Okay, so here's another concept coming out, right? From our own conversation. We said thought. All right, we have lots of thoughts. Where are thoughts coming from? Or desire. Okay, where is desire coming from? From a feeling of happiness. So there's some underlying, what I want you to get to, then there's no right and wrong in this, but when we're sitting down, just even five minutes, focusing, concentrating, meditating, whatever it is you decide you want to do, these are things that I, I kind of want to establish a, a thought pattern to say, if I need to focus in myself, what is it that I need to do? And we don't know that. And I'm just introducing a few ideas to say, okay, so if desire, all right, so desire leads, it's because why? It's going to give me some kind of happiness. All right, so what is the idea of happiness for me? It might be different for you. It might be different for you. Okay? 
So you see, we can keep boiling further and further down to a point where, so what is all of this Rudy coming from? And it's not something that we have to answer today, but it's a, it's a personal answer for ourselves. So what do we get to? Our values, right? Our virtues. What's a virtue? What's a vice? And that's what chapter 16 I mentioned earlier is talking about. And anger was one of them. Anger, right? So anger is loss of control. And earlier we just talked about, in the beginning, that the way life is going, everything should be making us angry. Because we have no control over anybody. We don't have control over a tree. We can cut it down, but it's going to spur new things. Okay? New branches are going to come out. I'm going to cut that down. Well, again, new branches are going to come out. I'm going to just take the whole tree, take it out of its roots. Well, somehow, there's a seed that fell somewhere, and miles away, that seed grew up into another tree, eventually. Okay? So nature is happening. We're part of that nature. So uprooting nature is not getting us anywhere because we're part of that. Okay? We talked about animals, right? Our own kids, our neighbors, our own family. So we don't have control over anybody. What about ourselves? Do we have control over ourselves? All right. I might say I want to go to the gym. How many times have we said that and never went? And then we might kind of console ourselves to say, yeah, you know, it was so busy today. I had to go do this. I had to do that. Some emergency came. And that seemed to happen every time. What's going on? <laughs> right? And then we might say, you know what? Going to the gym takes too long. I have to get the car, get the kids, put them somewhere. It's a, a long process just to get there. You know what? I'm just going to do it at home. All right? So we buy equipment for home. What happens with that equipment? I'm not saying we, none of us exercise and we don't do anything, but a common thing I notice becomes a hanger, becomes another place to store things, <laughs> right? So it's not about the things we think we want to do, but are we actually doing it? And who's controlling that? Is somebody forcing you not to do it? Somebody saying, you better not go to the gym today, you better not exercise, you better not eat, but we eat, we get on, we gotta eat, we eat. Okay, we wake up. It becomes our routine. We gotta brush our teeth. We brush our teeth. We don't even think about it. Okay, if somebody doesn't brush their teeth, we're thinking this guy's weird. Why is he not brushing his teeth? Okay, um, so there are some routines that's ingrained in ourselves from childhood, and we continue those routines, but we don't think why we're doing that. Okay, so if we're lucky, we have some good routines that our parents established for us, and we're continuing that. We might not have that benefit. Okay. So at some point, when we get old enough, we say we're an adult. Well, now it's no longer of who taught us something and that's why I don't do it. It's about I teach myself. Okay, at some point, there has to come a time where, you know what? When we were kids, our parents told us to do something, we did it. Okay? But now we have to go beyond that. We're not kids anymore. We have our own kids maybe, right? Even if you don't, you're, a, you're an adult at some point. And so what makes you that adult? Start thinking for yourself. Okay. You need to understand to say, you know what, is there value in what I'm doing? Does it make sense to me in my life? Okay. Uh, someone might tell you, you know what, you got to eat fish. It's the best thing, you get, you, may, you get some good you know, omegas out of there and you get this and you get these. But wait a minute, I don't eat meat. I don't eat fish. So should I start eating fish because it's healthy? Well, that's a judgment call. How are you going to come to that decision? You know, a lot of times, um, I had friends for myself you know, high school, um, I've been living here since I was eight years old, and this person, high school, 10th grade, you know, just came here from India, Brahmin, vegetarian, but we sit down for lunch, and he's getting a hot dog. I'm like, oh, what, what happened? We don't eat meat, so how come you're eating a hot dog? Well, my parents said that, you know, we live in this country, we have to accommodate ourselves to this country's lifestyle, and so he's eating a hot dog. Judgment call. So what happened to all those great values and morals and ethics and things like that? We don't eat meat because we don't want to kill animals and go, gone. Why? Because it wasn't a value for that person, for that family. They didn't know why they were doing what they were doing. And so when time came, when crunch time came and there was kind of stress, okay, just blend in with wherever you are. Just do what everybody's doing. Okay? You want to look normal. Well, look at the color of my skin. If I'm in a room full of white, or black, or any color, and I stand out, 
no matter what I do, I'm still going to stand out. So where's the difference? It's not in the look. It's not in what I'm doing. It's why am I doing it? Does it make sense to me? Is it of value to me? Okay. So um, anger. Anybody else? Any other thoughts, ideas? What other virtues would you think of? Or vices, like lust, anger, greed, right? Um, pick any one of those and let's kind of open that up to say, how does that relate in my own life? Right? Greed is another one. Very easy. Somebody gives you something, you want more, and you pull for more. You talk about any business, the idea of a business is to make more. Well, when do you go from making more in a healthy way, in a progressive way, in a long-term way, where it's helping you, you're getting, becoming more successful, at the same time, the community is also benefiting from that. What if there's greed? And so what's, what's greed? Greed is when you're asking for something more than you deserve, or you're harming somebody else where their self-respect is being hurt. Okay? Now you're stepping in the border. You're going over. So how do you differentiate that? You know, my happiness, yeah, my happiness is what? It could be anything. But the moment my happiness is doing something that's going to hurt any one of you, and your happiness is hurt, that should be the border. Because I need to respect each other's values and morals and ethics, right? And there may be something I'm doing wrong, and I need to real focus on that. And, you know, we talk about it, like, you know, in the Gita also it says, someone's doing something wrong, you need to point that out. Say, well, it's wrong. But why is it wrong? Is it just a societal wrong because the society agreed, you know what, this is wrong because it's going to hurt others? Or is it morally, ethically wrong, like we should not kill, right? If you drive more than 80 miles an hour, well, in New York, number one, you probably can't, right? Number two, you'll get a ticket. But why is that? Because driving that fast in New York, with all these people around, all this traffic, a higher chance of accident. And so as a society, we agree there's a certain speed limit because then everybody is safe and you're not overtaking somebody else's right to live. Right? So there's different morals and values and ethics based on what we know in the past. So our past experiences is something that's guiding our judgment today. Right? So that's another thing. We talked about all these different things. What guides our thought process? Well, what about our past? Okay? That's also guiding our thought process. Well, in the past I went left and I got lost and I did something and I fell into a ditch. Well, this time, if I'm in the same road, I know I'm not going left because I'm going to fall in the ditch again. Or if I have a GPS or some kind of map or somebody that knows the area, they can kind of warn us and say, you know what? Two miles ahead, there's a big ditch coming up. Why don't you take a detour and go around it? Okay? So we have people that can guide us who's been there, done that kind of thing. And spiritually, we talk about gurus and saints, sages, right? In financial world, we have financial experts. In health, we have doctors to guide us in our health patterns, right? What about in life in general? Who's guiding our life decisions? So these are things that, um, not a wake-up call, but it's something that I like to say, let's reevaluate what we're doing. Let's look at all the great principles and knowledge and wisdom we have and discuss it openly so we can kind of share each other's understandings, our past experiences, and we can make better judgment calls, you know? And from that, we all learn from each other. And from learning from each other, you know what? You've got 30, 40, 50 years of experience doing this one thing, and I have no clue. What do I do? Well, I don't know this person, but as a community, if we come together and we say, you know what? Yep, these are things I know. Let me share this with you. I just open your eyes into something that potentially could change your entire lifestyle. Right? And we can do that for each other. Well, where do you think society will be by doing that? So it will be benefited if you share your experiences with each other. Definitely. Okay. Um, some of the things that I would like to kind of introduce, and maybe we already do it, but um, you know, um, kids have so much to learn, and they absorb so quickly. You know, um, and it starts at home. It starts with our own lifestyle, with our own ways of thinking. If our child falls down, are we immediately going to go run to them? 
and yell at them? Why did you do that? That's why you fell? Oh, oh my God, you know, you got hurt. Let's do this. There's two different reactions. There's a third one. Don't react at all. They fell down. What's the worst that's going to happen? They say, oh, I got a boo-boo, uh, you know, a little baby falling down. There's not much to fall. <laughs> right? So if you don't react so suddenly, so abruptly, and you just stay calm about it, and I've done this with my kids to see if there's a difference, right? And what happens? They look at you. The first thing, they fall down. Before they even cry or say, I got hurt, they look at mommy and daddy. They look to see what is your expression, and they replicate it. If you're startled, that startles them and they cry. Okay, and then you have to console them. And to do that, you have to console yourself first. Right? So again, where did it start? From you. From you, yeah. Okay? From us. So we say we don't have any control in the life, but we actually do. Every moment, we're making decisions. And each decision we make at every moment is changing our future exponentially. Okay? What does that mean, exponential change? You look at a, a graph, you know, um, you could have a graph that's a straight line of growth, okay? But then you could have exponential growth that's gradually going steeper and steeper higher. Now any business will say, yes, that's the kind of growth we want, exponential growth. Well, what about in our life? What kind of growth, what kind of Im improvement do we, what kind of growth do we want in our own life? How can that happen? Okay. There was an example, if you, anybody know Tony Robbins? Okay, maybe not. So he's a, one, a great speaker, um, done speeches all around the world. Um, and he gave this one example that I thought was very interesting. He said, you know, um, he was looking at somebody playing, playing golf. He went golf, okay? Do you all know what golf is, the game? Okay, so um, he's hitting the ball, okay? And... He's putting, or he's trying to drive the ball really far, all right? So the ball is going to go at the angle that you're hitting, right? Now, what if you slightly change your hand angle? As an amateur, you're not going to know the difference, right? So you keep hitting the ball. One time it goes straight this way, another time it hits your friend on the nose, okay? Another time it goes the other way. But what's happening? Why is there so much drastic change in the direction of the ball? I'm doing the same action over and over again. What's changing? My hand, when I'm hitting the ball, might slightly turn this way or that way. And so the angle of the bat hitting the ball is going to be slightly different. Anybody playing cricket, baseball, any kind of, you know, sport can understand what I'm talking about, right? A slight change in the angle. What about the force? Yeah. One time I hit it really hard, another time I hit it really softly, okay? Or I hit the ground instead, I never hit the ball. So slight angle changes in the way my body moves, it's going to have a dramatic difference when I look long term. Right? Even if I got the ball straight, when I actually look where it landed, there could be a very big gap in difference. Right? At the end point. It could be a hundred yards apart. So what changed? That slight angle difference. And so that's what takes practice. And so that slight angle change, imagine that's your one thought. And there's a train of thoughts that we all carry with us all the time. And we judge everybody by that. We forget to judge ourselves. That am I even in the right train? Okay. I started going to the city for work. I take the subway. What if I hopped on the wrong train? Will I ever make it to my goal? No. So trains are like trains of thought. So imagine the way we think. There's a pattern of thinking that we all have right now. And what I'm doing is introducing, observe that pattern. Can that pattern be changed? And for that to happen, first we need to realize, well, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong train. I need to be able to figure out or to see where I'm going and say, I don't think I'm going in the right direction. That's step number one, to realize that there's something wrong. And that something wrong is a decision I made, not somebody else. Lots of people can give you directions and point fingers and say, go this way, go that way. But who decided to go that way or this way? You did. I did. So when I end up in the wrong place, and if I say, 
That guy told me to go that way. But you had five other people telling you to go a different way. You decided to pick one of them. You might have been right, you might be wrong, but it was your decision. And throughout life, every choice we make, the fact that you came here today was a decision you made. The fact that you're still here is a decision you made to stay. If you decide to come back next time, that's a decision you're going to make. And what's going to drive that decision? Your thought pattern. What's driving the thought pattern? How can I change from that train to a different train because I know I'm on the wrong train altogether. It's going somewhere totally different. Just like the ball, 100 yards apart, right? So in order to do that, well, what are our value system? How am I making the decisions I make? How am I making those thoughts? Where are they going? I could be thinking, she's fat, she's ugly, he looks gorgeous, he's this, she's that, she's so beautiful, right? Those are all thoughts constantly happening. I love the way he's explaining this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but you know, there's so many thoughts going on in our mind, we don't even, half the time we don't even know what we're thinking about. It's just happening. And then the moment I say, okay, what are you thinking about? That's when you start noticing, oh, right now I'm really hungry. Or it's almost time I gotta get my grandkids, right? That's when our focus changes. So our focus is changing all the time. So another symbol we have in our culture is what? Hanuman. What's the whole point of Hanuman? Hanuman is what? Innocence? Hanuman is a? What animal? Monkey. Monkey, right? So, I mean, a normal person might say, you know, God. You think of God, God is in our image and this and that, and you got a monkey God? What, what is that? Okay? You have an elephant God? Your God is an elephant? Human being, we're top of the chain. Meanwhile, you've got a God that's not top of the chain at all. Put a lion next to a monkey, what's going to happen? If a lion's really getting angry at the monkey, well, guess what? Monkey's gone. <laughs> and you call that your God? How does that make sense? What's that about? Right? You got a turtle as a, as a god. You got a fish as a god. Machi avatar, kurma avatar, vara avatar. All these animals, they're, they're not the top of the food chain. So what is all this about? I mean, how can you have so many gods? So these are things that, you know what? If it doesn't make sense, don't follow it. But at the same time, so let's take out of it. We had some great saints and sages and, and intellectuals of the time and they're saying there's some value in this? Well, you know what? Maybe I'm looking at the wrong way. Maybe I'm not getting what I'm supposed to get out of that. So one of the examples, why monkey? Monkey can't stay in one spot for too long. Same like a door mind. Okay? How long can you focus on something? And then if you have ADD, don't forget it. Okay? ADD is a very common thing right now. Uh, Hyperattensive uh, ADD attention deficit disorder. Right? It's actually a condition that doctors will diagnose somebody to say, this person, this child has a test and deficit disorder. They can't pay attention long enough. And so they struggle in school, they struggle in life, and, you know, and so on and so forth. And there's all kinds of drugs and medications to kind of regain that balance. But what is this about? So what is Hanuman saying? What's the symbol of Hanuman? What does it represent? Any ideas? Devotion, strength. Devotion, strength. Okay. What else? Abre Hanuman ne puja kariye, to Hanuman ni puja pre su kam kariye. Hanuman itle su. Ramna bhakta ata itle. Ramna bhakta ata itle. Okay. So she's saying we pray to Hanuman because Hanuman was a great devotee of Ram. Ram, God. Okay, ultimate. So there's some goal, some source. And Hanuman, out of anybody you can talk to, will say no doubt Hanuman was the number one devotee of that ultimate goal. And so what, what is our goal? If our goal is anything close to that, well, what kind of behaviors, what should you be doing? How should you be acting? Surrender yourself. Okay, so see, these are values. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Surrendering yourself, right? In order to surrender yourself to somebody, you have to have trust in them, faith in them. If you don't trust somebody, 
Why would you fall down and hope that they're going to pick you up or hold you and not let you get hurt and fall? That's Hanuman. Has nothing to do with being a monkey. The, the reason monkey? Well, our mind is like a monkey's mind. Okay? Our mind is like a monkey. It jumps one to another to another. Okay? There was an exercise uh, one of the Sadhgurus would, would be doing. Okay? Close your eyes. Focus on one thing. Okay? Uh, let's decide. Somebody say something. What do you want to focus on? Anything. Pick anything. doesn't matter. It's just an exercise. Focus on his work. Hmm? Focus, on his work. focus on someone's work. Let's keep it simple for now. Let's, um, since we're all looking here, uh, we'll focus on this projector. How's that? Okay. There's a projector there. Let's everybody just look at the projector. Okay. You got a projector, and don't think anything but the projector. Just for sake of time, we'll keep it short. Um, can somebody tell me what kind of thoughts came across your mind within these few seconds? Let's start here. Okay. Any other thoughts that came in mind? Could have been unrelated to it. So many. So many? So many. Go ahead. What? When you are focusing, you, you can uh, think about your family, your job, your job place, your driving. Okay. And anything. <laughs> Okay, so maybe at work you have a projector and you always have to go to those meetings and then those meetings you talk about, oh, I, I hate those meetings, you know, they're so boring and I got to sit there and do this. So one projector, one image led you to thinking about an experience you had with it in the past, right? So that could happen. And anything else? Anybody else? Clean idea. Huh? Clean idea. Green idea? Clean, clean. Oh, clean idea. Yes, clean idea. Okay. All right. So he thought about a concept. Okay. Just looking at projector opened him to a clean idea. Anybody else? Okay. So my, it was very short, and we did it long enough. You would start experiencing a lot more. But the point was that any one object or one thing or any concept. Okay. Focus on your nose. All right. From your nose, you're gonna think about breathing. Okay. I'm breathing. Oh wait a minute. I'm not breathing deep enough. So I gotta breathe deeper. Oh, suddenly now there's oxygen going into areas that never went before. Okay, because I'm breathing deeper. All right? And yawning happens. Why? Because you just realize I'm not getting enough oxygen, and yawn is capture as much oxygen as I can so that I get it into my body. Right? So these things start happening. And one thought leads to another, to another. And they're all related, but by the time your five minutes are done, you started at the projector and you end up at your friend's house that lives in Australia because you were watching a movie and it was so great and it was on the projector with the surround sound and all that and it all came out of this. You're no longer here in New York, you're in Australia with your friend watching a movie and eat popcorn. So in your mind you can go from one place to another, one feeling, right now you might not feel anything but you had so much joy, you got a smile in your face, suddenly like that, just by the thought process. Okay, somebody coming at you at that moment will see a smile on your face and you're just enjoying that, that memory you had with your friend. Your body is also reacting to that. Okay? What if you had a bad experience and someone walks up to you when you're focusing and you're going through that bad experience in your mind? Your body's reacting also. They're going to see that. Sometimes people cry during this exercise. Why do they cry? Because something happened in the past that they were reminded of suddenly that they might have not have thought about and they're going through this emotion. Okay? So that happens in an instant and your body reacts. So it's not just a mental thing that has no value. There's a physical reaction that happens and it happens by just changing your thought pattern. And it's not just what you're thinking but how you think of what you think. And that requires some kind of observation on your part, on my part, right? So first I need to realize I'm on the wrong train. Then I need to get out. And I need to figure out how do I get to the right train and then jump on board. 
right? But once I know I have a goal and I know the direction I need to go, the rest becomes easy. Then it's just a matter of, all right, let me look at the map. I got to go from here to there, and it's fine. But now I'm awake. Before, I was just following what others told me. Now I'm deciding on my own. There's a difference. And that difference, now I'm responsible for the decision I make. And that changes life. And that once that moment comes, I decide what I do. I'm responsible for the results that happen. It's because I did something and that caused it. Well, guess what? Earlier we said we don't have control over anything. And now I'm saying you have control over everything. You have control over yourself. And the moment you change that train of your thought pattern, life starts changing. Why? Because you changed. You didn't try to change anybody else. And I'm not here to change anyone. That's great. <laughs> Any thoughts? Again, it's open forum. It's nothing that uh, I do the talking and you just sit here. But uh, you know, this is a, a dialogue. It's a conversation that I like to have. And I and I see the things happening in your mind. Just please express them out. Anything you're feeling, any ideas, thoughts that come to you, any realizations that happen. It's very hard to decide like who's controlling who and what's controlling what. It's like you controlling yourself or something else is controlling yourself, which leads to believe that you control something or your thoughts controlled by something. That's true. We have a lot of um, input that comes into us, right? Society tells us what the normal is, right? If you're not wearing clothes that everybody else wears, immediately you're going to know the difference. People are going to look at you weird and say, okay, I did something wrong. Okay, am I dressed weird? Do I look weird? What happened? So there's society's input, then there's your family input, and family says you should do this or that, here's how you should live your life. Oh, I need to make this decision. Oh, you know what? Don't take that job, or don't do this, don't do that. Right? You have so many people telling you what to do. And that's not enough. You watch TV, you listen to the radio, podcasting. You have thousands of ideas and concepts bombarded onto you. Then you have advertisements in between them, right? So you have advertisements telling you, buy this, buy this, this is the best, this is the best. So you have so much input coming in. How do you decipher that? And before, when we talked about Ganesh, right? Ganesh's ears. Elephant's ears, right? They flap around. They keep the bugs out. Now, as a leader, one of the qualities is listen to everyone. Absorb it. He's got a big stomach, okay? Big storage. Take in everything. But filter that. In our bodies, we've got filters, okay? We've got the liver that kind of cleans things out. We've got the kidneys. So there's things in our body that no matter what we put in, it gets filtered. Things get absorbed that need it, and the rest gets excreted out. Okay? What happens when... He went out. What happens when in the input that we're getting is all negative? We start seeing the world as negative. Right? Because we put on those glasses, the sunglasses, with the dark color on it, and so everything looks dark. Right? So, Let's start reevaluating how do we see the world? And is that the real world or is it just my point of view? And is my point of view the right view? Because I'm saying it, so it must be right. I'm always right. No. Okay, so what's reality? Reality is very different for all of us. One of the examples I gave last time was, you know, you look at a bat. The way a bat sees the world is very different than the world we see. Okay? Bat's eyes are very different. A bumblebee, right? There's some creatures that have a, a hundred eyes or, you know, a hundred lenses in their eye. And they're seeing images not just in front of them, but around them on the side. Or some animals are able to move their eye left and right independently. We can't do those things. So we're limited in our own senses. What are our senses being able to absorb, right? The light that we see right now, that's getting reflected off of things and that goes into our mind, is the visible light spectrum. 
Okay. Anybody in science, you know, you look at the spectrums, there's x-rays, there's gamma rays, there's this, there's that. All we see, our eyes are looking at, is the visible light spectrum. It's a tiny part of the reality. Right? Sorry. No problem. So what about x-rays? We don't see that. We can go to a doctor, get an x-ray ordered, and we can see that. So that's a reality, that's a part of the world that we don't even know exists until somebody figured out, hey, wait a minute, there's more inside, and x-ray is one way we can see inside, right? So our senses are very limited. So what we see, we think we know everything based on what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, and we think, I know the world. We're far from that. Okay? If we depend on only our senses to tell us everything about the world, just look at it in a, in a simple way. Our senses are limited. They only say so much to us. And so what we see and assume that the world is, is not the real world. And so we need to keep our mind open. Our imagination is not limited. Our senses are limited. Our faith, our love in someone or something or some concept is not limited, right? Those are unlimited. There's no end to them. So there's, there's a difference between the world we know, the world we can touch and feel and taste, and then the reality that's really there, which goes beyond all the senses that we can put together. Right? And um, even Gayatri Mantra itself, so Om Bhur Bhuvaswa. Om, we say God. This is making a very simplified translation, but in one sense. So Om Bhur Bhuvaswa. So there is the world that we know, that we can know about, we can do science, experiments, touch, taste, feel, all our senses, right? And we can enhance those senses. We can make our eyes stronger, we can listen more strongly, we have antennas and these and that, right? So we can do those things. Then there's Swa, there is the unknown world. The world we don't know, we never experienced, and because we never experienced and saw it, I have no clue. But there is something more than what I know. I know that because my senses are limited. So I know there's things that I'm not able to sense. And it's part of reality. It's part of who I am. How do I know that? Well, imagination. I can think of so many things, right? Love. Love is something you can try to study in a, in a laboratory environment, but it's hard to do it because love is not just a physical thing. It goes beyond that. And so I know, conceptually at least, that there's something more to the world, to the reality, than just the physical world. And so I know this concept is there, that I know something that's real, I can touch and feel and taste it, but there's something unknown that I have no control over, that I don't know anything about. And so we're saying, Om, Bhur, Bhua, Swa. There's Bhua, the one in between. So between the known and the unknown, there's a whole world as well, and what is that? our doubts, our thoughts, our imaginations, our creativities, right? That bridges the gap between the known and the unknown. And all of that put together is Om. Om goes beyond the known. We can't understand the concept of God sometimes because it goes beyond our understanding. And that requires faith and love and trust. How are you? So we mentioned as a group, faith, love, and trust, right? Those things go beyond the physical that we know and understand. And so that should be some kind of inclination that, you know, there's something more to myself, to my own reality, than what I know and understand. And faith, love, and trust. So who will I have faith towards? Who will I love? Who will I trust? And if I don't love myself, if I don't have faith in myself, if I don't trust myself, how much of that can I do towards anybody else? So first thing, observe ourselves. Love ourselves, have faith in ourselves, trust ourselves, right? You look at a bird in the wild, just born. It's gonna start to try flying. Okay, it doesn't have to worry. It just does it. There's, there's faith, love, and trust without knowing and understanding all that. It just does it, right? Does it have to worry when its next food is gonna come? 
No. It just gets it. Okay. It knows how to get it, or it knows what's good, what's bad. We tend to forget because we have an intelligence. So our intelligence sometimes blinds us from our own reality. We think we know so much, and we don't know a lot at all. And so that humbles myself to say, you know what? As much as I might know, I know very little, and I'm open to learning more, and that will open the gates of my own life to something much greater. Okay, so I'm going to end today's uh, discussion here. Um, the next discussion that's starting up, and you're welcome to stay, is uh, Gita class for kids.